What's up, everybody? It's your favorite third party's favorite nerd, and today we are going to have a discussion video. Got to get a couple things straight out of the way before we get started. I don't respond to comments on discussion videos. I am always interested to see what you guys say, but because I kind of get everything that I need to say out for the most part, there's no sense in me responding to every comment. Just so you know, I am reading them. I do see them and such, but I don't respond to these videos. So don't think I'm ignoring you. It's just the way we do business for these types of videos. Secondly, no skit. It's just a discussion. It's not a proper review. Reviews get skits sometimes, most of the time, to be fair and honest and true to myself. Before we get started, let's talk about what third party is at, at some sort of level and differentiate it from a knockoff. Uh, I get a lot of requests for knockoff reviews, the Wei Zhangs, the MPP-10s, etc. And we will have a discussion topic on knockoffs. That's not going to be today. But as a general rule, to try to put it into perspective, right? If you've if you've ever drawn Batman, and you've put Batman in your own original pose, maybe on a a building or something, or perched on a gargoyle, but it's your own original pose, your own original idea for how to design the character, how to draw the character, you know, while still staying true to its iconic nature. But you created the pose, you created the scene, you created the drama, you created the ambiance of the piece. That is third party if you were to sell it. Knockoffs would be you taking tracing paper over your favorite artist's rendition of Batman and redrawing it line for line. And that is the, the difference on a, on a very simple level. There, are, there is a lot more to it. Trust me, we will be getting to that in a future discussion video uh, here soon. But for right now, we're just going to stick to third party, but better to define it before we get started. It should also be said that I love third party and I love the kind of fan driven grassroots spirit of it. Does that make sense? I, I'm, a, I'm a fan of it. Even when I don't like the toy or I have a lot of complaints about what the company does, I still enjoy the concept of third party and I still admire all of these companies taking a chance to step into this market and create something for us, the fans. And I think that we really need to appreciate all those options. So we're going to talk about a number of third-party companies. We're going to talk about their strengths and weaknesses, their histories, and their possible, probable connections to one another. So let's just get started. But we'll start here with Impossible Toys. Now, Impossible Toys have pretty much gone belly up at this point. They're, they're, they've closed their doors. They're no longer around. But what they did was they found little niche characters to make toys of that were affordable upon their release for the most part that no other company was making and most of which no other company has even made to this day. Now they haven't made any great toys but these Quintessons were pretty cool and they work pretty well for display purposes but another co company could come along and make one and they would blow this out of the water no question. <clears throat> these go for an arm and a leg on eBay and they are not worth those prices. Let me tell you, I reviewed them all. They're on my channel. You can find them. This was X2 Toys. I don't know that they've done any other full figure releases, but this was not a terrible toy. It wasn't a great toy, but there was promise here of some real great potential. Uh, I would like to see them make more full figures that I'd be interested in buying anyway. You know, I just, I don't know exactly. I think they've done some upgrade stuff. I'm not sure. <clears throat> but either way, it's it's hard to come across uh, any noteworthy product that they've made since then. And then this is, I think, before and after. This was their Six Sigma. And this was a, I really like this guy. He's got his issues. But he's a really cool and imposing looking bot of a six gun. And it worked really well. And I, I never heard of anything coming out aside from him. So... I'm a little bummed to not have seen any more uh, full figures that I was interested in come from this company, but I, I, I enjoy this product. So let's move on to the major players then, shall we? Which brings us to iGear. Now, iGear in the beginning made their claim to fame with kind of, uh, it's, it's no real kind of, they were knocking off Transformers Masterpiece line, and then they were improving it with minor things, and then Transformers Masterpiece even adopted some of those improvements, but that's not what we're going to talk about here. We're going to talk about their original pieces. So they did a lot of these mini bots for a chug scale. They did these two, which were their better ones. They also did a terrible swerve and um, a terrible gears. They also did a, a, a kind of decent brawn and outback, and they did this, uh, I believe they were behind this 
this RC as well. And then the last thing they did were these seekers. Now I met the guy that designed these seekers and we had a conversation over a couple of beers and it was a very good conversation. He was an awesome dude, took a lot of his time to, to talk to me about the ins and outs of third party and, and whatnot. It was very, very uh, rewarding experience for me. But having said that, he showed me a lot of these renders for these Raptor jets. And I told him, I was like, I don't know, man. I, I don't know if these are gonna, you know, at the price point and in, in the kind of niche that they serve, I don't know how they're how well they're gonna shake out. And I think this was the last thing that I gear proper put out. I could be wrong about that. Their strengths were kind of straightforward, intuitive transformations. And they were also getting a lot of things right sculpt wise. They were also kind of on the cutting edge of likeness of characters. Their weaknesses were that a lot of the joints were giving out. The other problem that they had was later on down the line were color issues. They were having problems with matching the color to to make it accurate to what you knew from the screen. And then what they would do was they would re-release it in a tune accurate color, which kind of just irritated a lot of fans. Now, I am under the impression, and once again could be wrong, that eye gear then turned into Toy World. And I'll tell you why. I, uh, you know, most known for their Throttlebots, their Dinobot Combiner, and their uh, most recent Devastator, which kind of took the world by storm. I'll tell you why uh, I think this. There was one time where I, I was on iGear's website and it had a contact link. And I clicked the contact link and it took me to an email address that was titled Toy World. So that led me to believe that there's definitely a connection there. I can't prove it. I'm just saying I don't profess to be Batman. I don't profess to be the world's greatest detective, but I don't think it takes much of a detective to put those two things together. Toy World has a tendency to use, in, in terms of their negatives, the plastic doesn't seem as high quality as a lot of the other companies. It's not terrible or anything, it just doesn't seem to be on par. I think that was the reasoning behind a lot of the breaking that was going on with their Devastator, was because of the materials that they used, and then their other problem tends to be tolerances. Sometimes it's, it's difficult to move things past one another in terms of transformation and so forth, and that tends to create not only a frustrating transformation experience, but because of the level of quality of plastic, sometimes potential breakage. What they do seem to be getting absolutely on the money these days is the likeness and the likeness with fairly straightforward simple transformations now some people don't like simple transformations and i'll tell you that these guys aren't necessarily the simplest but their devastator definitely was to me if if it's simple and straightforward it's more fun but at the same time i i see both sides of it right because at the same time uh a lot of the devastated proportions end up with big chunky blockage where you kind of wanted it to be a bit more elegant, but because there's not as many moving parts in terms of the, of the transformation, it, it can't lend itself to that elegance or to that level of sophistication, right? But these guys did, and like this gold bug here was one of my favorites uh, that, that they put out, uh, at least in that year. But I'm really interested to see where they're going because, you know, there's all these rumors that they're, they're going to tackle a Superion and a Bruticus, and they've kind of been doing Devastator in that Studio Ox style, so they'll probably continue to to match that style. And they end up doing a Predaking. The Studio Ox Predaking is just a, a design of beauty. So it, it would be really interesting to see how those, those combiners shake out. And I kind of be honest, so far I love their scale as we discussed in the last discussion video. And then we have what I like to refer to as the combiner companies, the companies that mainly do combiners. Yes, they do other things. Yes, I'm aware of that. I'm just saying that I feel like most people know them and they are most notably known for their combiners, for better or for worse. So let's talk about TFC first, which is a product that uh, they have produced right here. I feel like in a lot of ways, I'm in an abusive relationship with TFC. They're usually on the cutting edge of putting out the combiner characters. And I get so excited about the opportunity to have a representation of those characters that I jump on board, but they've never really put out anything that's great ever. They've done some single bots that have been good and it does seem as though they are getting better, but their combiners usually fail. What has improved is the level of quality in plastics their sculpts have also gotten better. Now, I think there's a lot of similarities between the designer of these guys and the designer of these guys. I, I think that those designs were sold off, but that's just my opinion. I can't prove that or anything. It just seems like there's a lot of uh, similarities, especially with their Lyokaiser. But where TFC always fails is in the stability of their combiner. Their, their Hercules had hip problems but not as bad as their Superion, which had major hip problems, which is comparable to their Predaking, which also had hip problems. We had a little bit of an improvement, actually I would say a significant amount of improvement in their Defensor, which has ankle problems uh, as time has gone on. It didn't initially, but now mine certainly does. 
And then they kind of went two steps backwards with their Lyokaiser, which has a ton of problems from hips to knees to feet. But we'll get into see how this guy compares, if ever so reluctantly. But what has improved here is sculpt and materials. What hasn't improved here is engineering of the combiner. Let's talk about these guys. This is Transform Mission, and this is Generation Toy. And I don't know for sure that they are the same company, but I believe they are the same company, okay? There's nothing that makes me think they are a different company. The packaging is similar, the line work is similar, the transformations are similar in, in the sense of how things kind of work. There's just so many similarities that it's very hard to ignore. Now, this was very similar to their copy, to Warbitron's Copytron and Bruticus. I did contact Generation Toys early on, and they told me, now who knows, I may have got the intern that didn't know any better, because it was via, uh, a, a, you know, like a written like email. So I may have got the intern that didn't know any better. But they told me, same company, different name. And I think that Warbitron was never intended to be the company name. I think that Bruticus was initially going to be called Warbitron. They never named their company, and it just kind of took off, and people started calling them Warbitron. Because there was all this confusion in the beginning. I'm not sure if you remember. It was like, the company's called Botron War, but the figure is called Warbitron. It was all this confusion. It got confusing. They rebranded. That's my interpretation of what went on and then we have this which is transform mission uh it's possible that's a new company it's just that the packaging is the same there's so much that's the same I, I i expect it's just the same people different name the pros and cons here one of one of which is not really a pro nor a con it just depends on your sensibility they go for a stylized look they don't go for a very screen accurate look and they've, they've they were more screen accurate in the beginning they've kind of gradually gotten away from that but now they definitely go for a stylized look. Some people love that. Some people don't love that. That's, that's a personal preference thing. Their strengths are in their transformations usually. They're fairly straightforward. Just enough complexity to kind of make it fun, but not enough to make it frustrating. That's not to say they haven't had frustrating pieces along the way. Uh, I don't care for their Mixmaster, for instance. But overall, they do a pretty good job with their engineering. Their sculpts, are, to me, are beautiful. Whether or not they fit your sensibilities, that's, that's a side conversation but in and of themselves they are beautiful sculpts they're gorgeous and they and they have a presence to them there was something about putting warbitron together the bruticus and sticking on a shelf that just it stole the show for a long time and it only got shadowed recently by this toy world devastator it has a strong presence they know how to make a robot look cool the materials are pretty good the articulation is usually pretty good every now and then they have a, a bummer uh like they have some bummers in their uh copytron set the problem with them it also seems to be a stability issue with their combiners. I haven't had any problems with mine, but I know there are people out there that had problems with their Bruticus. I just can't speak for that. I can only speak for mine, and my combiners have been pretty solid uh, across the board. Their Computron was solid, and their Bruticus was solid. Now, one of the problems that does plague this company is tolerances. Tolerances and stress marks. The stress, the stress marks have gradually gotten better, but so that's that's good because that means that they're taking, taking that into account with their smaller pieces and such. But the tolerances haven't really improved that much. The tolerances still remain to be an issue, and that's one of the major things that keeps holding this company back. Now, we can't have a third-party discussion without talking about Fans Project. And I think these are the only two Fans Project pieces that remain in my collection. I think I've sold everything else. No, I got one more. I got one more. So disregard. But... We have to talk about Fans Project because Fans Project is kind of it's kind of the tragic story of third party in a lot of ways. Like they kind of were on the cutting edge, especially in the beginning, uh, with their City Commander and stuff like that. And then they had Steel Core, which was an original character, and like there was a lot of things like that that were just on the cutting edge of what third party was doing. I think they may have done the first fully transforming figure. Not 100% sure on that, and don't totally care, because the, the point is is that they were ahead of the curve for so long in the beginning. There were so many people that were like, look, I'll pick and choose certain third-party stuff, but I'm going to buy everything that Fans Project puts out, because they just had that kind of clout. Their transformations were interesting. Some of them were just downright brilliant. Smart Rob and their Headmaster was probably my favorite transformation ever. That was their brainstorm. They, they, had, they just had so much excitement and so much momentum behind them. But what happened was other companies started coming out. And ultimately, they didn't grow as fast as these other third-party companies were growing. So what used to seem extremely innovative and cutting edge now started to seem antiquated by the standard of the day. I'm not exactly sure why they didn't grow with 
the times because they were definitely a company that could have. I was just talking to T2RX6 the other day, and he said that it used to be a time when Fans Project was what determined when he shipped his orders from his online retailer. And just to see how kind of fall, far the mighty have fallen in that sense, it's it, they don't really make a whole lot of noise anymore. To be 100% honest with you, just based off my own thoughts, I'm I'm not sure that that we'll see them around much longer because it seems like they've become they seems like they became complacent. They got surpassed and now they have lost interest. We're not seeing any new renders, we're not seeing any new teases. We're just seeing them kind of begrudgingly putting out the things they've already kind of promised the people they would. And as a result, I don't think we're going to see them around for much longer. Plus, some of their designers we've seen pop up with uh, Machine Robo Line and so forth. So it seems like there might be some displacement amongst the people there into other resources in different capacities. Now, Fans Project was definitely tied to Make Toys in the beginning. Uh, I would imagine they're still tied together in some regard. I don't know what that regard is any longer uh, because Make Toys... It's, it's interesting, Make Toys used to be the underdog to Fans Project, and now Make Toys has kind of surpassed them. It's like, you know, you, you push your little brother around, you know, and then you both get into high school, and he's been lifting weights, and you've been eating gumballs, and now he's going to work on you. Unique Toys and DX9. Now, this one is a bit more confusing, especially in the beginning. It seemed like the two were synonymous, and then at a certain point, they definitely tried to separate the two brands one being DX9, the other being Unique Toys. They're very tricky waters to walk in, right? So let's start with Unique Toys. Unique Toys for me, and it's much like DX9, but maybe less so. Unique Toys for me is, is, is hit or miss. And it's all in the aesthetics of their design. Sometimes I think their design looks right on the money. Like, I love this blur. It's one of my, it's one of my favorite pieces. I, I, I sing its praises all the time. Could there be some things that are done better? Of course, just like every other piece. But I really, really enjoy this blur. I think it looks like it walked just out of the screen. I, I, I love it. But on the other hand, their Springer doesn't look that way to me. And, and that's, that's what seems to be Unique Toys' issue. Now, what I do like about Unique Toys is that their transformations are always like fun and enjoyable and straightforward. They did the um, Abominus as well, and that was kind of the same thing, especially that Blot, uh, which is another really really interesting third-party piece um, maybe one of the most interesting to date but they they know how to nail an aesthetic they know how to nail a transformation and their their paint and all that stuff there all this stuff generally is good it's just it's just what specific design they're going for on any given day and you just never know with them it's just so flighty and it, it makes me think that they probably are just hiring different designers and some designers are speaking to me and other designers aren't that's unique toys haven't messed with a unique toys product that was just trash that i can think of and uh it's been very few pieces that i think have been golden like i, I love this blur i love their blot off the top of my head i can't think of any more now let's talk about dx9 because that's a bit more interesting they are even more all over the place for me. I have two DX9 pieces in my collection currently. This Astro Train and then Carry, their masterpiece scaled um, Studio Ox inspired Rodimus Prime. I love their Rodimus Prime. I think it's a great toy. This is kind of just a placeholder. Their biggest drawback to me is materials and aesthetics. What they've been doing as of late is going for a masterpiece scaled figure, like most third party companies, except for the ones that get left behind. As a result, they're held to the standard of masterpiece, a standard that has been set by Takara and has been reinforced by companies like MMC, Make Toys, Fans Toys, etc. So what has happened is they have lived up to the size, but they haven't really lived up to the build, and they haven't really lived up to the aesthetic. Uh, there's, there's little things like this Astro Train, I think, is the best available masterpiece scaled Astro Train available. That being said, there's things like this and this and a lot of this arm bit here that just don't feel masterpiece -y. They don't have that refined finish to them. And that's what I think is their major problem, is they're making masterpiece scaled toys that don't look like masterpieces. I say it for this, I say it for their Blitzwing. The only one I think is the exception is their Rodimus, but when you when you mess with that, you definitely feel the difference. I still think that's a great toy, but it doesn't feel like a masterpiece. Masterpiece has a very particular feel to it. I hope you know what I'm talking about. But that is, they're, they're also their, their plastics don't seem as smooth, as, as re refined, as... I don't know, as masterpiece for lack of a better term. It just, it feels like a company trying to make a masterpiece figure where I feel like a lot of these other companies are making masterpiece figures. Now, whenever you have one of these discussions, Perfect Effect has to be mentioned. 
but it's it's not as easy as that. Perfect Effect makes an arguably perfect product. The problem with Perfect Effect is that a lot of their toys don't have a lot of playability. You might say that Perfect Effect have the best sculpts in the game and have the best paint in the game and have the best hardware for joints in the game. But they definitely cater to an adult collector audience. They're not trying to make playable toys. So a lot of times they have fragile pieces or pieces that you have to be mindful of and manipulating, especially their Leonidas and, and, and whatnot. So it's, it's not that that's really something to gig them on. It's just saying that know what you're buying. You're not buying a toy to play with on the floor. You're buying a display piece. And for that display piece, that fully posable, fully articulated display piece, it's always top shelf in terms of its quality. It's just not meant to be messed around with. It's meant to be posed and put on a shelf because there are a lot of fragile pieces and, and a lot of dainty pieces and you just have to be mindful of those things. I think the audience that they are catering to, they're doing a perfect job. I'm just not really in that audience. I'm not really interested in most of the character choices that they choose and I'm not really interested in a lot of the design cues. This was from the comics so I picked this one up but I didn't pick up their Leonidas and I have no interest in anything else I've seen from them since. But that's not to say that they don't make a great, outstanding, top shelf product. Giga Power and Cloud9. The reason why I grouped them together, it was a rumor that was started by Fans Toys that they were the same company. Cloud9 actually contacted me to take a look at their Quake Blast and they asked if I had any questions. And I gave them three questions, one of which was, are you Giga Power or connected to Giga Power? And it was also the only question <clears throat> that they didn't answer. Sometimes, you know, when it comes to silence, it, it, it usually, you know, sp speaks volumes, right? It leads me to believe that they are probably, if not one and the same, very, very closely related. These are the only products they've released so far, and they're both good in their own way. We'll have a discussion about this when we get back to the KO idea and what makes a KO, etc., etc. But this was pretty good. I like this a, a fair bit. I have noticed that mine, like the hip joints, don't hold up really great uh, which become the, the, the shoulder joints for the bot which is frustrating like I'll often come downstairs and he'll be posed right and I'll come downstairs and he'll be one click out but overall it was a pretty good effort the problem with Giga Power is that you don't have much to judge on because they've only released really one toy under their proper name they've released two versions of it but only one mold so it's really hard to judge their their power you know, and potential in the game when they haven't released a whole lot of product. Now, I myself have, have given MMC some flack here and there for not getting stuff out, and people give fans toys flack all the time for not getting stuff out. But it's funny that nobody, I think people just forget about Giga Power, and that's why they don't give them a hard time. But, I mean, these guys are well overdue for a second release. To be honest, they should be on their third or fourth. But I, I just don't know what the holdup is, and, and I can have a conversation about Giga Power and Fans Toys as well, but um, in what seems to be a bit of a cat and mouse game between the two. But, but for now, I'll just say that what they have put out has been pretty good, but it's hard to really give them a clear-cut ruling because... They've put out so very little. And if you take out this, which does borrow a lot of engineering from another toy, and you really see this as their only unique original product, 100%, it's really hard to judge a company based on one release, a one release that's taken place over the course of two years. Now, where it is, they got the other two Dinobots, uh, I think Swoop and Slag, coming soon. But, you know, Christmas is coming soon, too. You know what I mean? Maybe after they get a couple more releases under the belt, we'll be able to give a, a more fair determination. But he did have a QC issue with his hip. Some people were snapping his hip off. I didn't have that problem, but that was something that was out there. It's just worth noting because they've only had one release, and it's the only thing negative that I can think to say. Other than, um, <clears throat> this isn't necessarily a bad thing. It comes down to personal sensibilities, but there is an awful lot of busy line work here. If, if there are some people now, especially with Takara, going a more traditional, right off the screen look that are really shying away from this particular look. And if you fit in that category, these are not for you. If you don't, then, then by all means. But this is something that I have seen that maybe I, I, I just can't decide yet. I think I need to see them all together before I, I really lay, lay claim to my, my judgment here. But it's something that needs to be noted that this may be too much. Oh, Keith. KFC. Keith's Fantasy Club. This is going to be more involved. 
So they initially made a name for themselves more or less with these tapes, uh, which are all pretty much trash and were even bad by the standard when they were released. Not as bad as they seem today, but still bad, especially their Squawk Talk and Beast Box. That one was really bad. They made a very kind of poor reputation for themselves. But then we saw this come about, and this seemed to be an improvement. Now, this has, this needed ratcheted hips for one, you see. And that, that tends to be a problem with, with, with some of Keith's stuff is that uh, some, of, some of these joints don't hold up over time. But, we're, but hopefully we'll, we'll see uh, uh, that get better with more ratchets and, and so forth. However, this is what gave this company promise in my eye because the sculpt was right here. The transformation had some weird places uh, involved and it, they continue to kind of have that issue. Like his backpack, if you saw my review, was just a weird bit of engineering there. But this seemed like it had promise. Still didn't quite seem like it hit the mark of what you want in a Masterpiece Huffer, but it had promise. And then they put this guy out, which was a game changer, not to third party companies, but for, for their company specifically. This, the main issue here was paint chipping. Aside from that, this was a well-engineered, smoothly transforming, great aesthetically, masterpiece scaled blaster and this is what kind of put them on the map in my opinion for making a toy that wasn't just disposable they then have gone on to do other things that are fairly reputable their reflector i feel like is kind of in the ballpark in this i don't feel like the transformation for their reflector is as smooth as this is so i think it's a slight step back but it's still within the same ballpark and then they did these guys which for all intents and purposes are great, which is not something that you have always expected to say about this company. So let's talk about the strengths and weaknesses of Keith's products. And when we talk about Keith's products, let's not forget there are reasons to believe that he's tied to both SXS and X Transbots. Now, the X Transbots things that clued me in was one time when I bought Ollie, the piece of tape that went over the, the seal of the box, which was an X Transbots product was a KFC sticker. Maybe they just ran out of X Transbots and just had to get them out the door. SXS, I think the, the first clue for that was SXS offered a upgrade for their Ultra Magnus when their Ultra Magnus wasn't even out yet. Something along those lines. But there's reason to believe that all three are connected, if not more, probably more. But I don't have enough information to speak on that, so we're not going to. I, I'm not gonna talk about SXS because it's the only SXS product I've ever messed with. I just wanted to illustrate that they are connected. The problem that plagues KFC is the same product that plagues X Transbots. They also have the same strengths. They both nail aesthetics. That's Scourge, it's undeniable. That's Blaster, undeniable, looks great. The problems are twofold. They used to have the problem of just materials. They used to have weak materials. The materials have improved. The joint choices, the actual mechanic choices, like the different uh, hardware, you might say, fluctuates. Sometimes you get good ones, sometimes you get bad ones. He had a, a head issue. A lot of their mini bots, the X-Trans bots, mini bots, have those male-female pens that can come separated. Like, that's, that's a hardware choice. And that could be, that's an easy fix, but sometimes they fall into that, that problem. The other thing that they suffer from is over ambitious transformations. It's like all of them, maybe with the exception of him, have something extremely frustrating about the transformation pro process. With him, it was the feet. With the Junkions, it was the backpack. With Reflector, it was some of those panels that had come up and swipe around. You actually had to kind of bend it around other pieces. Like, there's always something. And that's an area where if they were to improve that, lock down the hardware, you'd see a lot more people putting KFC in their top three companies. You would see that happen because they're close. The problem is their reputation. And their reputation didn't come out of nowhere. Their reputation is based on weaker products. And reputations, have you ever heard this? Uh, reputations are a lot like tattoos. They're, they're easy to get and they're hard to get rid of. And, and that's what's going on with them. However, I do feel like they are at a corner, that they could bend a, bend a corner here. They just really 
tightened up on those hardware choices and really made for smooth transformations. You'd see a lot more people start mentioning them with, with more pride than, than what they have in the past. Next up is Bagcube. Bagcube is the company that I feel like is on the rise faster than any other company. They're the company that feels like they are really making conscious efforts to strive towards being the best. But what Badcube has done is improved. Gradually improved, gradually worked on their prices. Their prices have always been their Achilles heel, right? Their uh, brawny and back lane, which were given to me as a gift. I'm not going to mention the, the, the gentleman's name, but he knows I am forever uh, grateful. And whenever I see him on the shelf, I, I think of you, sir. But they were expensive. They were expensive. For, I think they were like 100 bucks for a mini bot, which is just not common. Their Warpath, which is also a mini bot, then came in at 120 And then Sunstreaker dropped down a little bit for being a full-size car. Do you know what I mean? And that's what I'm, I'm talking, that's really the improvement here. There are, there is some paint stuff that's improved here, but the, the, the biggest issues that Badcube has had is keeping their prices manageable and competitive and stepping their paint up. There's not a lot of paint here. There's not a lot of paint here. There's more paint here and he was cheaper comparatively. Badcube also struggles with making, in my opinion, intuitive transformations, but to be fair, the only one that was that was extremely frustrating was that one, and we'll see how their Trailbreaker turns out. I heard I heard that it's 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 an improvement in that regard, but their Trailbreaker to me looks even better than their Sunstreaker, and to me, their Sunstreaker looks closest to what I want for a masterpiece scaled figure. Brawny looks a little uh, stylized. Warpath looks very stylized. Sunstreaker looks pretty close to being on the money. Now, what they do have down pat is their engineering. Yes, sometimes it's overly complicated. Yes, sometimes it's frustrating, but it is well thought out. There is a smart person behind it. That much I can tell, and I think most people can just from messing with it. Their materials feel very... Uh, this one feels a little bit more masterpiece -y, but like these two felt a little bit more like fans project to me. Like that sort of like rough but smooth plastic. Uh, I, I prefer this more so with my masterpiece scaled stuff. But either way, it's not really an issue. It's all solid plastic. It doesn't feel cheap, and, which is good. So Baggy has a lot of things going for them. They have a lot of aesthetic, aesthetic things going for them. They have a lot of materials things going for them. They have articulation things going for them. What they are lacking or what they have been lacking in the past is paint and price. P and P. And they seem to be working on both. And if they can get both of those things underneath their belt, I think you're going to see Bad QB and name mentioned in the top three more often. I believe they were behind this this RC as well and then the last thing they did were these seekers now I met the guy that designed these seekers and we had a conversation over a couple beers and it was a very good conversation he was an awesome dude took a lot of his time to, to talk to me about the ins and outs of third party and, and whatnot it was very very uh, rewarding experience for me but having said that he showed me a lot of these renders for these Raptor jets and I told him I was like I don't know man I, I don't know if these are gonna you know at the price point and in, in the kind of niche that they serve I don't know how they're how well they're gonna shake out and I think this was the last thing that I gear proper put out I could be wrong about that their strengths were kind of straightforward intuitive transformations and they were also getting a lot of things right sculpt wise they were also kind of on the cutting edge of likeness of characters their weaknesses were that a lot of the joints were giving out the other problem that they had was later on down the line were color issues they were having problems with matching the color to, to make it accurate to what you knew from the screen. And then what they would do was they would re-release it in a tune accurate color, which kind of just irritated a lot of fans. Now, I am under the impression, and once again could be wrong, that iGear then turned into Toy World. And I'll tell you why. I, uh, you know, most known for their Throttlebots, their Dinobot Combiner, and their uh, most recent Devastator, which kind of took the world by storm. I'll tell you why uh, I think this. There was one time where I, I was on iGear's website and it had a contact link. And I clicked the contact link and it took me to an email address that was titled Toy World. So that led me to believe that there's definitely a connection there. I can't prove it. I'm just saying I don't profess to be Batman. 
I don't profess to be the world's greatest detective, but I don't think it takes much of a detective to put those two things together. Toy World has a tendency to use, in, in terms of their negatives, the plastic doesn't seem as high quality as a lot of the other companies. It's not terrible or anything, it just doesn't seem to be on par. I think that was the reasoning behind a lot of the breaking that was going on with their Devastator, was because of the materials that they used, and then their other problem tends to be tolerances. Sometimes it's, it's difficult to move things past one another in terms of transformation and so forth, and that tends to create not only a frustrating transformation experience, but because of the level of quality of plastic, sometimes potential breakage. What they do seem to be getting absolutely on the money these days is the likeness and the likeness with fairly straightforward simple transformations now some people don't like simple transformations and i'll tell you that these guys aren't necessarily the simplest but their devastator definitely was for me if if it's simple and straightforward it's more fun but at the same time i, I see both sides of it right because at the same time uh, a lot of the devastated proportions end up with big chunky blockage where you kind of wanted it to be a bit more elegant, but because there's not as many moving parts in terms of the, of the transformation, it, it can't lend itself to that elegance or to that level of sophistication, right? But these guys did, and like this gold bug here was one of my favorites uh, that, that they put out, uh, at least in that year. But I'm really interested to see where they're going because... You know, there's all these rumors that they're they're going to tackle a Superion and a Bruticus, and they've kind of been doing Devastator in that Studio Ox style, so they'll probably continue to to match that style. And they end up doing a Predaking. The Studio Ox Predaking is just a, a design of beauty. So it, it would be really interesting to see how those those combiners shake out. And I kind of be honest, so far I love their scale as we discussed in the last discussion video. And then we have what I like to refer to as the combiner companies, the companies that mainly do combiners. Yes, they do other things. Yes, I'm aware of that. I'm just saying that I feel like most people know them, and they are most notably known for their combiners combiners for better or for worse so let's talk about tfc first which is a product that uh, they have produced right here i feel like in a lot of ways i'm in an abusive relationship with tfc they're usually on the cutting edge of putting out the combiner characters and i get so excited about the opportunity to have a representation of those characters that i jump on board but they've never really put out anything that's great ever they've done some single bots that have been good and it does seem as though they are getting better but their combiners usually fail what has improved is the level of quality in plastics. Their sculpts have also gotten better. Now, I think there's a lot of similarities between the designer of these guys and the designer of these guys. I, I think that those designs were sold off, but that's just my opinion. I can't prove that or anything. It just seems like there's a lot of uh, similarities, especially with their Lyokaiser. But where TFC always fails is in the stability of their combiner. Their, their Hercules had hip problems but not as bad as their Superion, which had major hip problems, which is comparable to their Predaking, which also had hip problems. We had a little bit of an improvement, actually I would say a significant amount of improvement in their Defensor, which has ankle problems uh, as time has gone on. It didn't initially, but now mine certainly does. What's up everybody, it's your favorite third party's favorite nerd and today we are going to have a discussion video. Got to get a couple things straight out of the way before we get started. I don't respond to comments on discussion videos. I am always interested to see what you guys say, but because I kind of get everything that I need to say out for the most part, there's no sense in me responding to every comment. Just so you know, I am reading them, I do see them and such, but I don't respond to these videos. So don't think I'm ignoring you. It's just the way we do business for these types of videos. Secondly, no skit. It's just a discussion. It's not a proper review. Reviews get skits sometimes, most of the time, to be fair and honest and true to myself. Before we get started, let's talk about what third party is at, at some sort of level and differentiate it from a knockoff. Uh, I'm getting a lot of requests for knockoff reviews, the Wei Zhangs, the MPP 10s, etc. And we will have a discussion topic on knockoffs. That's not going to be today. But as a general rule, to try to put it into perspective, right? If you've, if you've ever drawn Batman and you've put Batman in your own original pose, maybe on a, a building or something or perched on a gargoyle, but it's your own original pose, your own original idea for how to design the character, how to draw the character, you know, while still staying true to its iconic nature. But you created the pose, you created the scene, you created the drama, you created the ambiance of the piece that is third party if you were to sell it. Knockoffs would be you taking tracing paper over your favorite artist's rendition of Batman and redrawing it line for line. And that is the 
the difference on a, on a very simple level. There are there is a lot more to it. Trust me, we will be getting to that in a future discussion video uh, here soon. But for right now, we're just going to stick to third party. But better to define it before we get started. It should also be said that I love third party and I love the kind of fan driven grassroots spirit of it. Does that make sense? I, I'm, a, I'm a fan of it. Even when I don't like the toy or I have a lot of complaints about what the company does, I still enjoy the concept of third party. And I still admire all of these companies taking a chance to step into this market and create something for us, the fans. And I think that we really need to appreciate all those options. So we're going to talk about a number of third party companies. We're going to talk about their strengths and weaknesses, their histories, and their possible, probable connections to one another. So let's just get started. But we'll start here with Impossible Toys. Now, Impossible Toys have pretty much gone belly up at this point. They're, they're, they've closed their doors. They're no longer around. But what they did was they found little niche characters to make toys of that were affordable upon their release for the most part that no other company was making, and most of which no other company has even made to this day. Now, they haven't made any great toys, but these Quintessons were pretty cool, and they work pretty well for display purposes. But another co company could come along and make one, and they would blow this out of the water, no question. <clears throat> these go for an arm and a leg on eBay, and they are not worth those prices. Let me tell you, I reviewed them all. They're on my channel. You can find them. This was X2 Toys. I don't know that they've done any other full-figure releases, but this was not a terrible toy. It wasn't a great toy, but there was promise here of some real great potential. Uh, I would like to see them make more full figures that I'd be interested in buying anyway. Uh, you know, I just, I don't know exactly. I think they've done some upgrade stuff. I'm not sure. <clears throat> but either way, it's, it's hard to come across uh, any noteworthy product that they've made since then. And then this is, I think, before and after. This was their Six Sigma. And this was a, I really like this guy. He's got his issues. But he's a really cool and imposing looking bot of a six gun and it worked really well and I, I never heard of anything coming out aside from him so I'm a little bummed to not have seen any more uh, full figures that I was interested in come from this company but I, I, I enjoy this product so let's move on to the major players then shall we which brings us to iGear now iGear in the beginning made their claim to fame with kind of uh, it's, it's no real kind of they were knocking off Transformers Masterpiece line and then they were improving it with minor things. And then Transformers Masterpiece even adopted some of those improvements. But that's not what we're going to talk about here. We're going to talk about their original pieces. So they did a lot of these mini bots for a chug scale. They did these two, which were their better ones. They also did a terrible swerve and um, a terrible gears. They also did a, a, a kind of decent brawn and outback. And they did this... Uh, and then they kind of went two steps backwards with their Lyo Kaiser, which has a ton of problems from hips to knees to feet. But we'll get into see how this guy compares, if ever so reluctantly. But what has improved here is sculpt and materials. What hasn't improved here is engineering of the combiner. Let's talk about these guys. This is Transform Mission, and this is Generation Toy. And I don't know for sure that they are the same company, but I believe they are the same company, okay? There's nothing that makes me think they are a different company. The packaging is similar. The line work is similar. The transformations are similar in, in the sense of how things kind of work. There's just so many similarities that it's very hard to ignore. Now, this was very similar to their copy, to Warbitron's Copytron and Bruticus. I did contact Generation Toys early on, and they told me. Now, who knows? I may have got the intern that didn't know any better because it was via, uh, a, a, you know, like a written like email. So I may have got the intern that didn't know any better. But they told me, same company, different name. And I think that Warbitron was never intended to be the company name. I think that Bruticus was initially going to be called Warbitron. They never named their company, and it just kind of took off, and people started calling them Warbitron. Because there was all this confusion in the beginning. I'm not sure if you remember. It was like, the company's called Botron War, but the figure is called Warbitron. It was all this confusion. It got confusing. They rebranded. That's my interpretation of what went on and then we have this which is transform mission uh it's possible that's a new company it's just that the packaging is the same there's so much that's the same I, I i expect it's just the same people different name the pros and cons here 
One of one of which is not really a pro nor a con. It just depends on your sensibility. They go for a stylized look. They don't go for a very screen accurate look. And they 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 were more screen accurate in the beginning. They've kind of gradually gotten away from that. But now they definitely go for a stylized look. Some people love that. Some people don't love that. That's that's a personal preference thing. Their strengths are in their transformations usually. They're fairly straightforward, just enough complexity to kind of make it fun, but not enough to make it frustrating. That's not to say they haven't had frustrating pieces along the way. Uh, I don't care for their mix master, for instance, but overall, they do a pretty good job with their engineering. Their sculpts, are, to me, are beautiful. Whether or not they fit your sensibilities, that's, that's a side conversation, but in and of themselves, they are beautiful sculpts. They're gorgeous, and they and they have a presence to them. There was something about putting Warbitron together, the Bruticus, and sticking on.